Ghost of Sunday, welcome. We come now at this time on this way on the first day of November, which is uh, National Native American Awareness Month. It's kicking off this month. And so we uh, encourage you to do some more research on that and find out what it means to honor American Indians and why you should honor American Indians. So, uh, well, indigenous peoples all over North America. This morning, we're going to uh, look at uh, a reading from the Hebrew Bible. It's going to be Ruth, from the book of Ruth. And uh, one of the few few books in the Hebrew Bible that are actually wit written by a woman. And so, uh, why don't we turn to the, the first chapter, right out from the start here. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephraites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. Then she started to return with the daughters-in-law from the country of Moab. She had, for she had heard in the country of Moab that God had considered God's people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to the land of of your mother's house. May God deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. God grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. And then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more better for me than for you because the hand of God has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law is gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May God do thus, and so to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Powerful reading this morning, powerful reading. So we're going to go to New Testament, Magog, uh, chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. And uh, so I want to think about this. I'm going to do this in English. We're kind of pressed for time, so I'm just going to read this in English this morning. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who would like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces 
and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called to his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasure. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her property, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Here's the word of the Gospel of Mark. And that is powerful reading also which many people have spoken on, including me. But today, we want to think about our reading from Ruth. Ayadola, 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 E1, 1 through 18 in the book of Ruth. Chagawalo, D-E, Ale. Well, you know, I think we're just going to stay with that. We're going to stay with values. You know, this reading here in Ruth says a lot about values. It also says that soul searching challenges us to prioritize what we most want in life. Uh, many times, you know, when I run into people on the street, I hear them talking about, you know, how you, how's the world treating you today? That's a common reading here in Indian country, here in Oklahoma. How's the world treating you today? Well, there's another way of looking at it. The question is, how are you treating the world? And soul searching makes us look at what we value, what we care about most in our hearts and in our minds. And in this reading, Naomi, despite her situation, because here is a woman whose husband, first of all, let's back up this minute, First of all, she was living in her homeland. They were starving. You know, food was short supply. Well, back in these times, back in the day, they weren't worried about wealth as much as they were worried about having food on the table. That was more important than being rich. And so, back in this time, you know, having a husband meant everything. He would go out and do the hard labor to make sure there was food on the table and, and the wife would stay home, take care of the family, do the garden and help support in that way. So it was pretty much hard labor for everybody. And uh, what this meant was, if you lost your partner, you lost the primary source of survival. Your guarantee of continuing to thrive was pretty much over at that point. And you were going to struggle. So here's not only she's in this country where she has a lot of a lot of hungry going on and they had to pack up and move to another country and things were good. She had a husband and two sons and then she lost her husband and then she lost her sons. So her primary means of survival was gone and she knew it. And you know, it talks about her having two daughters-in-law but it doesn't talk about having any grandkids. So we can surmise from the reading thus far that Ruth and uh, Orpha hadn't had any children yet, so they had no other support to help them out. Or if they had children, they were very young. If one of them had kids, they were very young, and they didn't talk about it. So here's these three women on their own, no major means of support. It's a rough time. So what they did was Naomi decided, well, I'll go back home. At least I know some folks there that might be able to take care of me. God apparently has brought rain upon the land, you know, things have changed, and there's food back in Judah where she's from. So she decided to head home. But she wasn't confident in her ability to get by. So instead of thinking about herself, she was thinking about her daughters in law Because they were her daughters as far as she was concerned. And she was responsible for it. 
she valued being service to others. She valued caring about others as much as herself. So she decided at that point in her concern for them and her fear of their suffering to encourage them to stay with their families. Go back to your family where you came from. You got people who will help you out. And right away we see that they, they didn't want to go. They want to stay with her. We don't know what that means. We don't know what that's all about. They knew the situation. They knew how bad things were, but they had decided it was more important to stay with Naomi than it was to go back to their, their homes. Naomi was upset about this. She was really worried. She thought, well, we're all going to die now. But that didn't stop her. That didn't slow her down. She took the next step. She encouraged him over and over again. Go home, you're going to be better off. That's the short version of that story. And that pressed it to the point where Orpha decided to go home. Ruth did not. So while we've been talking about Naomi, the hero of our story right now is Ruth. Because here, Ruth has made a choice to value her mother-in-law as much, if not more, than herself. Now, how many of you can say that you've done that for others? How many of you can think about folks in your lives that you have valued more or as much as yourself? Let me tell you, when I was younger, you know, I grew up military brat, when I was younger, we lived in Germany. A little town called Simbach. We have Simbach Air Force Base where we were stationed. We lived in a little town called Inkenbach. And I also lived in Ramsheim, but that's that's another lengthy story. But in Inkenbach, it's this little cobblestone community, a little small German community back then. It might be a lot bigger now, but back then it was a little little town, and the German people there were awesome. They really liked having neighbors. They welcomed me in, they welcomed all of us in. I made friends there. I learned to speak some German. Uh, got to know folks in the neighborhood. I had some stories to tell you. The owner of the property where we stayed, he had these plum trees in the backyard, a big old cherry tree, and everybody had them. And every fall, and he was like, you know, these things, we, we can't possibly eat all this. Y'all go ahead, help yourselves. Mm -hmm. I ate more plums than I can, I, to this day, I still like plums. He, t he told me, you go climb up that cherry tree and you just eat it all you can. And you know what? I did try. I tried to eat every cherry on that tree and it was a big tree. And I got way up high. I must have been 25 feet up in the air. I was up there eating cherries as fast as I could. I ate so many of them, I got sick of them, literally. So I don't eat many cherries anymore because I really don't much care for them anymore because I ate too many when I was a kid. Rhubarb, garden, everything. This guy, was, he, he was a gardener and he'd give it all away. He cared. He cared about his neighbors. He cared about his uh, folks and his friends, his family, the community. You know, in the wintertime, we'd all go out there behind the Catholic church there on the hill they open up their land to us. We go out there, all the kids in the neighborhood would be out there sledding down the church property now behind the church out there. We had some fun back in those days. And that, that shows the people valuing each other, caring about each other, watching out for each other. Now here in the Midwest, in the United States, when I was younger, there was that too, because I remember down in Del Rio, we had that kind of environment too. We had a lot of fun times down there when I was a kid. Here in Oklahoma, in the last few decades, things have changed. How many of us now live in neighborhoods we don't even know the names of our neighbors? Places where we work, we don't even know the names of the people who work in the offices around us or 
work in a store or whatever. I work in a hospital. Those of you who work in hospitals, how many of you know the names of the people who clean? How many of you care and value the people you work with? I'm going to tell a story here real quick about that. And the name of the story is the name of the cleaner. During her second month of nursing school, the professor gave the students a quiz. The last question stumped most people in the class. It read, what is the first name of the woman who cleans the school? All the students had seen the cleaning woman several times. She was tall, dark haired, and in her 50s. But how would any of them know her name? Before class ended, one student asked if the last question would count towards the grade. Absolutely, said the professor. In your careers, you will meet many people, all are significant. They deserve your attention and care even if all you do is smile and say hello. The students never forgot that lesson. They also learned her name was Dorothy. And this comes from a article named Part at Work edited by Jack Canfield Part at Work. Jack Hanfield and Jacqueline Miller. I guess that's a book, maybe. Uh, so that story is quite a quite a reflection of what we, as human beings today, value most. Do you know the people who live near you? Do you get along with them, or do you stand in judgment or stand in fear? of everybody else. And I can tell you here, here in Northeast Oklahoma there's a lot of people standing in fear. They're more focused on fear than they are on love. And that causes them to value fear being afraid more than being loved. What would Christ think about that? Well we already know the answer to that question because in our story from Mark Christ shows that people who give a little bit out of their abundance don't really value what it is they're getting. Don't really value the services they're being offered. Don't really value God. They value wealth. They value money. More than that. Whereas the old woman, the widow, who gave everything she had, she valued God more than anything. She valued being in good relationship with greater and with community. And that shows what her values are. In our story from Ruth, we see, as we carry on with the reading of Ruth, in her little uh, speech here, if you want to call it a speech, her statement, that she valued her mother-in-law to the point that she was willing to suffer and die with her, that she was willing to convert to her God and be among her people as an outsider more than she did her own survival. That shows you the character, the type of person that Ruth is at her heart. So it's no surprise to me that the ancient Hebrews took this scroll, this book, written by a foreigner who converted to their religion and turned her into a prophet, a valued member of the community above all other women, so much so that they put it in their religious book. That's what that represents. That's what that means. And we are just scratching the surface of what's going on here. There are consequences. There are consequences and risks that you take when it's valuing others. You have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to say, I'm going to make this leap of faith and trust in God 
and be of good service. You know, it is easier to try to be safe than to put yourself out there. It is. It's a lot easier. It's a lot lonelier. You know, people get more paranoid the more isolated they are. So, I encourage you to think about what you would do if the roles were reversed. What if you were the janitor? And some of you may be watching this are the janitor. Would you want people to value you when you were younger and considered nobody on the street? Did you want people to value you? Did you believe in yourself enough? You felt like you deserved to be treated with dignity and respect and valued by others and didn't get it? Are you now helping to set that good example for others to follow? Or are you treating others in kind the way you were treated? What are you doing? I can tell you that God commands us, not just encourages us, not just invites us, not just suggests that we, God commands us to value others as much as we value ourselves, and we'll not settle for anything less. So think about in a nerd study of Ruth and study the Gospel of Mark. Find out for yourself. Walk in beauty. Father.